Hey, everyone. This is part two of our episode covering the on-the-ground experience some of our fellow footy travelers had at the Copa America final on Sunday, July 14th at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami. If you haven't listened to part one yet, hit pause and go back to start with that episode. If you're ready for part two now, let's continue the conversations with FFT Monica Bosilovac. So yeah, Monica, um, just remind everyone who you are as a soccer fan, as a footy traveler. Hello, I'm Monica, and I am just that, a a big soccer fan, a former player and coach, and big fan of the U.S. men's and women's national teams, big fan of the NWSL, big fan of football anywhere, anytime, any place. And so all of that brought you to the Copa America final in Miami at Hard Rock Stadium on Sunday, July 14th. Tell us, you know, what were your plans? What were your expectations? And then what was your actual experience once you got there? I made my way to the stadium and I was with a, a group of friends. There were about half of us, honestly, that had tickets. And then there was another like group of us, about half, probably eight to 12 people that didn't have tickets at all. But we were like, hey, we're going to go. We had access to a pre-event space and so we're we get there maybe two hours before the start of the game or the planned start of the game and me we make our way to the Michelob Ultra kind of pre-event space and so we're just outside the stadium on the south side and we're kind of just hanging out like taking in the vibes it was it was awesome can I ask real quick did those without yeah. tickets intend to procure them and then go into the game or was it just were they just there for those vibes it was legitimately they were they were there for the vibes, but we we just kind of say there's always a ticket. They were hoping that they would get last minute tickets into the match some way somehow, but they were also at peace if they if they didn't. And we had also we had talked about should we tailgate beforehand? What does it look like? And they had advised everyone if you don't have tickets to the game, like don't come, don't come, don't add to the chaos. But there was no we were like, okay, are we going where are we gonna get turned away at? And we never got turned away. So we were able to access like straight up to the gates or to the south side of the stadium where they had a big screen. And it was cool because you could already see people were like, it was like you were at a big drive-in movie theater because the screen was up and they were gonna play the game on the south side of the stadium and you had just a great like atmosphere and energy. And it was a sea of yellow. I don't know if it's because it stood out so much, but it was a sea of yellow. So we make our way to the top stand and or to the like little area for the pre-event space. And we're actually elevated. We're on like the second or third floor of this structure. So we're overlooking the South side and you could see the supporters section and they were like, had their drums, they had their smoke. Like we walked through that for a little bit and it was a little like packed just momentarily, but then you kind of got out and you were into your space. Once we got to this third part of the, the structure and we could see this like view, that was honestly like when the madness started happening. So about what I, time was that? I think it started like maybe around seven. Okay. So I I go use the restroom that's like attached to the stadium and then walk back. And I just run into a really good friend of mine and she's in tears. And it was like, I didn't know, I, we weren't planning to meet up. She's in tears. She's like, oh my gosh. I'm like, Laura, like come with me, you know? Like what's going on? She's like, I was trying to get into the stadium. Like there was so much pushing. Like she just felt so scared and unsafe and overwhelmed and because she was getting pushed and like she was just like i'm i'm giving up she jumped a fence away she was trying to get away from the crowd she okay. jumped a fence just to like find space happened to bump into me i'm like oh girl come with me like <laughs> let's go hang out so at that point then we could watch we could watch people just rush one gate and like start running in when a gate would fall or when a gate would be opened. And then you could watch people run to another gate when another gate would be open. From above. We could then start seeing from above. We had like almost an aerial view. And we're like, this is kind of madness. Like what's going on? All of a sudden then too, they have that spiral ramp that I'm sure you've seen in videos too. And you could see people climbing up like different tenting structures, different any structure, any fencing, anything that people could get to get elevated and then hoist up to the ramp to get over, you could see, you could just see it happening. And then all, you could see this ramp of people just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds as they made their way up and around and into the stadium. It was madness. It was just, it was just kind of madness to watch, but we were obviously in like a safe space. But then like for me, I still have a ticket. So I'm like, all right, I think it's time. Like, let's try to get in. The game now at this point is delayed, but we're like, all right, 
it seems less crowded. Let's go to a north, like let's go to a further gate that doesn't seem as crowded. And that was like where we were supposed to enter anyway. Did you know or get noticed that the game was delayed before you decided to go in? We did. We It came up for us on this. We had kind of heard through like social media, oh, the game's delayed. And we'd even been chatting like they can't kick off at this right time. Like we were just watching people not be let in for an hour. Like it was eight o'clock and we're like, they, they can't start the game without this or like this, you know, what, what will they do? And I was surprised that they delayed it initially only a half hour. We then assess out. We're like, all right, let, let's try to get in. Let's go to a Northeast gate. And I had two... I had two women with me, like both from Columbia, both had got tickets secured, had gotten them that same day as well. Like one went with a friend of ours and they got in straight away at the Northeast gate. They're like, we're inside. We're like, awesome. We're making our way there. So then it's myself and three other individuals. One of them is this like Colombian woman who's just so passionate. You could tell it was going to mean so much to her to like get to be there for this game. We start walking to every single gate. And we're at a gate on the east side, we're at the east gate, and all of the gates were locked. We could at least like kind of get up to the front of the gates, but I, they just, they told us to go to a different gate. They're like, we're not letting people in, go to the south gate. We're like, we were just at the south gate. They told us to come here. And so then we're like, now you're just having us run around to every gate and you're not going to let us into any gate. I watched a cop come up to the gate and just put a padlock on it in front of me. I was like, and all of these people outside, they're holding up their phones like, we have real tickets. We have real tickets. Let us in. Let us in. It was the like saddest cry for just like, you were helpless. You were you were literally locked outside the gate with nothing but your ticket that many people spent, you know, $2,000, $3,000 on. And so, yeah, I watched this cop just like, you know, make an announcement, go to this other gate. This one's not being open and then padlock it. And so what then, time is this, would you say? Now it's probably like between 8.15 and 8.30, maybe. And people are still like, I'm walking around the state and people are still scaling different parts of the structures to get inside. And there's like, I didn't see anyone get tackled or trampled or anything like that, but people are still scaling structures to get in. We walk, we walk all around. We go to every single gate. By this point now, I, the game got delayed again, right? I don't know. What it got delayed. I, if I'm total recall here, it might be inaccurate, but at least two or three times. So we're, we finally make our way all the way around the stadium and it's the same thing at every single gate, people just standing on one side, not opening the gate and fans on the other side pleading. And eventually it kind of gets communicated to us through a police officer. That's like the stadium is at 115% capacity. We're not allowing anyone else in like I it's we're, we're over capacity and everyone's like, that's so messed up because that should be impossible. Yeah, we all have tickets. And it was at that point calm on the outside from a rushing the gate standpoint, but it was this sense of just hopelessness because you couldn't do anything. All they, all people could do was plead their case and show their tickets, but no one was budging. So what happened? So my friend, you know, she's does the anthem outside. You can you can hear everything. So she does the anthem outside. She's still trying to like find a way in. We say, "Hey, let's go back to our space so that we can at least watch the game on the screen. Let's go back to the south side. We come back to our friends that are all still there as well and don't have tickets. But now at this point, enough people from that event space have left and transferred their tickets to our friends. And now it's like, it's close to halftime at this point. Okay. So I'm one of the people I'm like, I've had a long day. I care about watching the game, but I don't want to spend the next 20 minutes even like walking around the stadium again, just to watch an iron gate to be in an overcrowded so, stadium where your seat is probably gone, probably gone or, or something, you know, you just didn't know. And we had also heard and like our friend that's on the inside, is like, please, like you guys keep trying, keep trying. They're going to let people like they're letting people in, but we're on the outside. Like they're not letting anyone in. And she's like, no, they're kicking people out of their seats. That was the word was like, they're kicking people out of their seats. Like keep trying. Cause she also knows how much it means for us to like be inside. So the, the group of our friends that didn't have tickets an hour ago now have tickets. My phone is at 1%. There's two people left in the group that don't have tickets. I'm like, I'm done. My partner and I, we're ready to go home. Like, we're just going to go watch it somewhere else. We're good. And so I transfer my tickets really fast on 1%. They got through in time. And my friend, the two remaining guys got our tickets. 
we go home, we watch the game like from a hotel lobby, like enjoy it as much as we can, you know. Glad it like glad it went to overtime just so that we got extra right. soccer and like yeah. got to see a little bit. Got to see the goal. Sad about, yeah. the, sad about the result. Yeah, sad for Columbia. But even like I know I know all of the people that went in, they their tickets weren't scanned. Like, yeah, they could show that they had real ones, but even at that point when it had died down and they were allowing people back in. I really, I think they got in shortly after halftime. They missed the Shakira show, unfortunately. But who is to blame for all this? Who, where does the responsibility lie? It comes down to the event organizers. It truly does. Because how is it that in every other major tournament and country and stadium across the world that people have figured this out and that you can have a process where there's checkpoints along the way that's not immediately at the stadium gate itself 10 feet away from where you're going to scan tickets so to name it it's comfortable and it's they have to do such a better job of organizing and if you know you're going to have fans that are that passionate and motivated and want to be inside the stadium and you've locked so many people out before before the actual physical locking of the gates So many people were locked out of the stadium to begin with. So why did you create this environment and this culture, both from a psychological standpoint, that people are going to want to be inside that much and don't have access to it? And from a physical standpoint, you created this environment where people are on the outside trying to get it. They failed on both those accounts. Up next is our last conversation with the FFTs who were there that evening. Here's Cheyenne Foster, fan vlogger and bona fide American soccer fanatic. So Cheyenne, remind our audience just how big of a soccer fan you are and I'd say how experienced you are going to major soccer games, tournaments included. I am big enough that I was willing to travel to the World Cup by myself in 2022, which I thought up until very recently made me pretty well versed in what it was like to attend um, games or big matches as a neutral. And I've been attending matches as a neutral almost my entire adult life, mostly because I engage with soccer in in plenty different ways. So it's nice to watch it regardless of who's playing. Uh, Because I am a fan vlogger, I like engaging with fans of of all teams. So you definitely vibe with with what I like to do and, and how I engage with the sport. So you were at the Copa America final last Sunday. Tell us what was your experience, maybe starting with what your plans and your expectations were, and then what was your actual experience once you got there? So the decision for me was relatively last minute. I am currently based on the West Coast with this van that I bought to to live in and travel in for soccer specifically, believe it or not. And I knew I needed to come back to the East Coast to take care of some personal matters. So my parents live on the coast of Georgia, and that's four, maybe five hours from Miami. And I mean, given all the driving I've been doing since I bought the van, I thought I'm entirely too close to not make this happen. And I had what I thought was a ticket connect, but I didn't have any sort of content plan. I had one friend that I was going to go with and I ended up driving down that morning with an understanding that, that it was a pretty big deal because what I had seen on SeatGeek, StubHub, GameTime, whatever, was that the ticket prices were still $1,900 at the cheapest. So I arrived, I would say I picked my friend up from the airport at about one o'clock and we went and got lunch, watched the Euro final at a restaurant and then thought, you know what, let's just head that way. Um, get there relatively early, park somewhere in a neighborhood nearby. I don't mind walking. We walked a little over a mile from where we had parked. And that infamous Southeast gate where everything went down, we had missed it by maybe 10, 15 minutes. So when I got there, oh, so you, so when everyone, I'll say everyone, there were enough people that had stormed the gate as the gates were opening that they decided to shut down entirely. And when we arrived from that side, it looked like from our angle, it was just a bunch of people waiting to get in. And because we had shown up when I thought gates were opening, my idea was, well, forget this corner. We'll just go around to another corner. This clearly seems to be like the meeting spot from everyone coming from the parking lot. But on our way to the other gate that we ended up getting into several hours later, 
we passed by this super long line to get into the club and premium level seats. And that's when I noticed, oh, there's a good couple hundred people that are still waiting to get into the premium seats. So either I mistimed when gates open or they haven't decided not to open them yet. I had no idea what was going on because by the way, there were no security outside the gates. They were only inside. And yeah, and it was at that point where I also looked down at my phone and thought, I need my tickets to load. I should probably figure figure that out. Should have figured it out (laughs) a mile away when I had better service. But while I was waiting, I stood next to a wall that had vines on it and saw that there were a handful of Colombian fans in the most cartoonish way possible, like on each other's shoulders, trying to climb up the vines. And I thought, okay, that's a little crazy, but I've been around drunk men at sporting events before. Like this is, this seems, this seems a little crazy, but. That's where they thrive. Security. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, You know, seeing the video after the fact and realizing that what I saw and what I had had witnessed to that point, I realized that I I saw so little of what had actually gone down. And then seeing videos of like people covered in blood or, oh my gosh, someone ran in with a pet carrier with a shih tzu. I was like, this is so crazy. But I thought that the climbing up the wall was crazy. No one got over the wall security kind of peered over and it was so it was so funny at one point this guy's like come up here I'll do something about it and I thought oh Jesus this is this is embarrassing um but it wasn't until I stayed waiting with my tickets loaded but with very little understanding of, of why we were waiting and waiting at this other gate I would say northeast the northeast gate I believe we ended up standing there for two and a half hours and the only news that we were finding out the only way we were getting news, rather, was through Twitter, which brings its own existential question of the purpose of an app like that and, and breaking like real-time news and giving real-time information to people. But because I don't speak uh, Spanish at all, unfortunately, I wasn't picking up conversations people are having with each other. I had to ask people next to me directly, like, hey, do you know what's happening? And they just said they're holding the gates. So things are just like piling up more and more and more again, as, as we're realizing, oh, the game is being pushed back. We're seeing that there are people in the stadium, but we're not seeing anyone go up the escalators. There's, there's no opening of the gate. So we just waited and waited um, and realized that we weren't going to miss the game because it was being delayed, but that we were very, I knew that something must have been going on far more significant than the, the videos here and there online, just because th- there had to be something bad enough that would cause them to lose the kind of money you lose when you delay a game that's being nationally televised. So can I ask real quick um, at this point, uh, you know, you, you showed up and you didn't realize you said that there had been a rush into the gate. Did you realize that now having seen Twitter and having asked those questions to some other fans about why it was actually closed the gates? Yeah. And I, I recognized that it was happening at that one gate we walked past and that it seemed like a big enough deal that they were holding everybody. And I, I then realized, oh, no wonder people are calling on the vines. And when we got a little bit of news that they might open the gate we were standing at, the crowd I was with then looked up on the side of the stadium and saw people climbing up the walls and, and running up stairs that were connected to the stadium, but not through the gate that we were standing at. And the entire crowd just started yelling, like, don't be stupid, get down. There was, there were a number of people, uh, the large, the, the majority of the population I'll say was so over it. There were children, like babies being held, um, full families that you could tell just really wanted to get in and sit down. And so they started heckling the people that were climbing up the building. But it was one of those things where they were climbing up the building because no one was stopping them from the outside. They were only able to stop them from the inside. So the, it was very clear that there were no that, that they were overwhelmed, that there was not enough staff to handle what was happening or, or security, et cetera. Because when we finally were let in around 8.30, which is about two hours, 15-ish minutes after we got there, everyone started kind of putting their hands up to say, like, we're not pushing, we're not pushing. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe they're also doing that because, you know, when you go through 
security mags. It's like hold your medals above your head, whatever. No, the the mags were not making any noise. No one was manning them. And then when we got to the turnstile where your tickets get checked, no one was manning those either. Wow. So it was one of those situations where I was like, this is, I don't see anybody around. And I once I got up and there's kind of these circular walkways instead of taking like a straight up escalator that we were going up to get to the level that we were at where I turned back and saw, oh, there are a handful of security now that everyone's in and they're just standing there making sure people know that they're now at capacity, which is to say they weren't checking who did and did not have tickets. They were just saying, this looks like the amount of people that we should probably let in. We're not going to let in anymore, which means if you were like, if you decided to wait out the whole ordeal but you had tickets and and you thought, I, well, I don't want to be in this crowd that's clearly already been proven to be dangerous. I'll wait a little bit. And when the crowd dies down, but I still know I've got 30 minutes to get into the game, then I'll go. Even if you had a ticket, they're like, no, you can't come in. That's insane. So, yeah, so insane. And I, I recognize after the fact that it's a it's a safety procedure to kind of just let people in so that you don't get trampled and there's no bum rushing, et cetera. But it just meant that all these people that had decided to, to fork over all this money were SOL because of the amount of people that were willing to get in at all costs. So that was strange because I felt a sense of danger, but I did not feel personally as if I was in danger. But I also recognized that if there had been a dangerous event, like someone bringing in I mean, this sounds right. so dramatic, but what if someone brought in a bomb or even a smoke bomb or yeah. or a weapon or or a fight broke out that the ability for anyone to get anywhere was severely limited because everyone was like shoulder to shoulder by the time you got to where your seats were. And oh, by the way, like it gets even worse for me. I reckon I realized that whoever had had given me their tickets had seemed to promise them to someone else as well oh. because my ticket master like very legitimate looking scan either put on Apple Pay or scan the QR code whatever with the exact section seat row everything two gentlemen came up in the seats that I was standing in and said we have the same and I said where did you get your tickets and it, the conversation was not, it, we, they weren't speaking English. They were just showing me their phone and they were getting a little bit aggressive. And I was already to get to the point in that row that I had those tickets for, we had already passed by two rows of people. So it's like, I'm standing in my seat. There's someone in front of me in the row, in, the ti- in a tiny row. And Yes. Yes. Wow. So gotcha. I got nervous because I thought, I don't, I don't want to fight with somebody I don't want to be sardined into this row. I don't feel like the ticket that I got was, I don't feel like the person that gave me their ticket was super honest about it because theirs looked like a a verified ticket master as well. Like we were holding the same thing. It wasn't a screenshot after I on their end for the, so that's, here's the thing. After I left, I was like, what if it was a screenshot or what if it was a miscommunication and they were just in the wrong section or we were in the wrong section or, or what if? But by the time we had gotten to that point, every single aisle was filled with people. It was like when you go to a supporter section and it's GA and everyone's like, oh, I'm going to get in. I'm going to shove in. There's no room. And we were so hot. And I was so overstimulated that I stepped out. And then I thought, oh, you know what? I actually feel like I could have fought, really fought for this but I had already watched a video on Twitter while I was waiting that said, oh, someone else was in their seats and security didn't help them. And it was two gentlemen. So I'm like, well, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to be in that situation where I where I'm get in some sort of physical altercation. And I felt so silly. But it, to me, I was like, well, of course, of course I would have. <laughs> of right. course, it was in my nature to be like, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Take it. Right. I mean, um, you know, that's self-preservation. That point, thought, well, you don't everyone wanna... else seems to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I just felt like. Everyone else seems to be squeezing in all over the place. I'll just squeeze in somewhere, which is what I did. And I was squeezed among, I would say, a good like 40, 50 people who clearly did not have tickets who were standing behind like a handicap row. A security person came through and made space for someone in an actual wheelchair. But other than that, they kind of just stood and, and watched. There were people that were straddling the metal railing and 
again, I'm checking throughout the game on Twitter. I had other like content creator contacts or, or people I knew, or even just like larger names that were posting their whole experience that said, oh, the row in front of me just got cleared out because none of them had tickets or security finally came and took care of, of the people that were at our seats. And, but that wasn't happening until halfway through like the second half. So um, I was very grateful that I'm able-bodied and happened to be hydrated. And I was very grateful that I was in a situation to watch the game with relatively few obstructions, visual obstructions. Um, but I did not sit in a seat. I did not have a seat the entire game. Who's at fault here? I mean, there were the fans who rushed in. Security decided to close the gates. There's security. Uh, it sounds like being very overwhelmed. Who, who bears the brunt of the blame? Um, Conway Bull, I think there, there there's so many, first of all, Hard Rock Stadium has, has hosted so many major events before and America on the whole, I think is accustomed to very big events. So when people say, and that's a stadium hosting a a world cup, uh, world cup games, they're going to be a a world cup 2026 venue. My thought is, yeah, but FIFA has been around and, and FIFA does not operate with a home base. So FIFA knows how to work with security to put on safe events in whatever country ends up hosting. But con Mabel, from what I understand with conversations I've had with, with friends who have worked with Conmebol as part of U.S. soccer or as part of um, either doing content or putting on events or engaging with this tournament on the whole, it sounds like they were not willing to shell out the money or do as much as they felt was required in order to provide a safe environment. And when I say that, I mean anyone who doesn't have a ticket should not have been able to touch the stadium from the outside. There should have been a huge perimeter. And there has been for World Cup games I've attended. There has been for every festival I've ever gone to in this country. There, and, and I, the craziest part was as a content creator, and I ended up posting the quickest video of just being among the crowd saying, I'm at the Northeast Gate. It opened at 830. Our tickets were not checked. It ended up getting about 830,000 views. Wow. And it's gotten a lot of comments. And so many of the comments that I've read this week have been exhausting. They're very um, racist. They're very rude. They're very, like, they they lack any sort of thoughtfulness or interest in meaningful dialogue. And I don't think that I posted that with the idea of it having the most meaningful dialogue come out of it, so to speak. But my frustration is that there are pardon the French, there are jackasses everywhere. Yeah. The trolls there will are find you be people. Yeah. But, and, and those to me, I'm like, you guys are just as bad as the, I would say maybe 500 to a thousand tops people that showed up to hard rock stadium and we're going to claw their way in no matter what. And those, I think there's a lot of people who we have documented on video who do deserve some of the blame, but in a world where crowd mentality and turns into mob mentality turns into the most degenerate behavior, you have to have a protocol in place that doesn't allow them even a thought that they would stand the chance to get in. And that's on in my in my opinion. So there it is, what it was like on the ground that evening in Miami. It was, as all the footage and videos showed, a lot of fans acting completely absurdly. It was also a lack of infrastructure to handle any of it. In a place, mind you, that is completely capable of handling it and that has done so in the past. In my personal opinion, Colombian fans, Argentinian fans, neutral fans, any fan that tries to break into a stadium, those fans rightfully deserve blame. But the responsibility lies with the tournament organizers. In this case, Colmable. This situation, this opportunity to get that close to the gates and be able to climb into the grounds should have never existed in the first place. And it doesn't exist 99% of the time. It has been proven over and over again that setting up a multi-checkpoint perimeter works. 
It happens at World Cups, most noticeably for us as footy travelers. But it happens at all sorts of events, footy and non-footy alike. This was a choice by CONMEBOL, and it was a terrible choice. And again, in my personal opinion, CONMEBOL, oh, the world, but especially those fans who had tickets and paid CONMEBOL their hard-earned money for them, those fans who have been legitimately traumatized, CONMEBOL owes them a massive and profuse apology, at the very least. Now, pivoting back to the fans. In the moments during and the days following that night, there has been no shortage of criticism of the fans themselves. And in particular, given the fact that, sure, a lot of the crowd was in Columbia jerseys. A lot of Miami's residents are Colombian. And, again, to be fair, that jersey does catch the eye more easily than most. But given the fact that a lot of the fans rushing the gates and climbing structures to get into the stadium appeared to be Colombian fans, do Colombian fans in particular, or maybe the Colombian Federation, I don't know, owe anyone an apology as well? And before anyone gets upset or jumps down anyone's throat, to be fair, there are Colombians and Colombian fans that weren't at Hard Rock that night who are speaking up fairly critically of those who were. Is it that is it is it Colombians that are living here in the States that do not understand or that because they live in Miami, they don't understand how the rest of us in other parts of the country had to deal with with some of the you know, discrimination that we have to deal with because your actions are affecting not just Colombian Americans, but all Latinos. That's our final guest, Danny Navarro, who grew up in Miami to Colombian parents and who has dealt with everything that being Colombian American comes with. And growing up in Miami in a place where, you know, it's it's a figurative bridge where you're trying to be too Colombian, but you're never Colombian enough for Colombians and in, in, in back in the homeland. And then, you know, when, when as I grow older and go to places like Charlottesville for school and, you know, move here to D.C., you're not American enough. Danny himself would say that the behavior of any fan, Colombian or otherwise, who breaks into stadiums is, in no indirect language, a disgrace. It's a disgrace. A lot of, uh, I think, uh, other, other content creators that are Colombian Americans and Colombian nationals themselves, they were like, having this feeling to apologize, even though it wasn't us that did this, right? Like us. Personally, But as we talked to him and got his take on it all, we both agreed that the way some people have been reacting to these fans and their behavior, especially behind the protection of their digital screens, it hasn't been helpful. Trust me, I saw all those comments and it, they were bad. And I think it doesn't help also that, you know, even amongst Colombians. They were they were commenting on these other you know these fans that did break in at, you know as as savages and all these other you know very inhumane comments I guess you could say in the sense of like dehumanizing not inhumane but dehuman dehumanizing comments and it's not helpful because then it gives other people with more nefarious agendas right away the language and the ammunition necessary to label us as you know uncivilized. I will say this: I know it's easy to do so, but we shouldn't conclude that. All people who fit into a particular group for one specific reason, like being Colombian or being a Colombia fan, we shouldn't conclude that everyone in that group is then fundamentally the same for a separate reason that is demonstrated by only some of them in that group. And it's a shame that it's the fans that didn't show up to the stadium to break in that day. Fans like Danny, who feel like they need to apologize on behalf of the belligerent others. But it's also fans like that who are perfect reminders of something. Our people in our country, you know, as a culture, we've dealt with so much of the of the discrimination, the negativity and the stereotypes that are thrown against us. I'm not saying that to justify any actions that any Colombian fans took. Absolutely not. But it's sad for me because, again, we have all throughout this tournament been playing really good. The fans have been fantastic. We're showing that, you know, we are very joyful people. We love our football and we want to show people that this is who we are as an identity. And it's just, it just, just gets thrown away with these images. The rest of us, no issues. Why would we? In other words, we saw a specific collection of both Colombian and Argentinian fans. Those who were willing and able to travel to Hard Rock that day. And even in that group. Only some of them were the ones breaking in. The fact of the matter is, there are more fans that didn't show up to the stadium that day and who didn't break in. 
we simply didn't see those fans. We obviously wouldn't. That does not mean, though, that they are not the majority. So far, we haven't heard from him. And I'm sure most of you by now are wondering, what does Mike think about all this? So, with the final word, and to take us home, Mike, what do you think about all this? Wow. Um, I am greatly appreciative of our very brave and courageous guests to share their stories. And I'm not going to belittle the fact of how traumatic an event that was. Being a footy traveler who really focuses on going to major football events that can be life-changing in the majority of time, they are life-changing in a positive manner. To have something like that turn into a moment where it's a survival, people are feeling deeply threatened for their safety, is just absolutely uncalled for. I don't want to go about talking about blame. I don't want to go about talking about how to fix it in the future. We can talk about that ad nauseum. I think talking about the human toll and the human condition about going to something that people are so passionate about and, and feel so fervently about in terms of this beautiful game and having it turn into something so despicable is, is a travesty. It's something that I feel is a microcosm for a lot of other things in this world. I think the vitriol that comes out after all of this where there is a lot of finger pointing and there is a lot of tribalism that is trying to really put the blame in other people's uh, hands is really unfortunate because the large majority, I would imagine, of the people that were attending that event were there to support a team, a nation, a player, or generally just a sport that they loved. And for that to be even remotely taken away to bring people into tears, to bring people into panic attacks, to bring people into heat strokes. That is a just woefully utter failure of really all that is holy to this sport and to the the purpose of footy travel and fandom. And it's it's really sad for all of us that it had to happen. It makes me think back to in recent times, the 2020 UEFA Euros final, which was hosted in 2021 at Wembley Stadium. They have a documentary about this on Netflix and people openly talking about jibbing, the, the British term for intentionally breaking into soccer matches that you don't have a ticket to. That is just absolutely awful. I, I, I'm, like, I, I'm at a loss for words. People paid hard-earned money to have their life changed, essentially, to see and to witness greatness, to witness a spectacle that a significant amount of people in this world do not have the luxury of being able to witness in person. And to be able to take that away from someone because you're selfish enough to want to break in without a ticket is awful. And for the people that paid and didn't have to get their ticket scanned, I'm sure there's a level of guilt there, knowing that other people paid and couldn't get in, and you did, and, and maybe didn't have to go through security. I'm sure that even just the fact that there was so much chaos definitely left that entire event with this feeling of fear, not knowing that if you didn't get scanned, if you didn't get a security check, what could happen? I mean, we're talking about an event that has thousands of people and no more than a few days before, there was fighting amongst players in the stands. <laughs> so it's just this perfect storm of a lot of really awful behaviors and decisions. And I just pray that we find a way to fix this because it feels like we're headed towards this new era of Hillsboro tragedies that could be occurring soon. And I pray that that doesn't happen because I think it could significantly tarnish what we all know as the greatest sport in the world and the beautiful game. So 
I think that we all need to maybe take a closer look at the way in which we attend and organize these types of events and maybe how quickly we move to judgment and place, placing blame. You know, there's a lot of people in situations that they react in different ways. Their fight or flight or submit parts change in certain situations. And so, yeah, perhaps some people were able to get into the stadium without a ticket, but they weren't intentionally doing that. Or they got lost from their friend who had their ticket and they got in. We can't know every person's story, but we do know that they were being advised to not try to illegally break into a stadium. And for those people, that's where I think a lot of pain comes from for a lot of other fans. So with that, please, 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 all of us continue to be loud Let's continue to be proud, but please, let's be good to each other. All right, everybody. That does it for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, a reminder to rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening and to share the show with a footy friend or two. You can check out our fan shop through the link in our Instagram bio or head directly to footytravelers.square.site. The Footy Travelers Podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R Media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen My Mars. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.